power move makers. This series was created with a simple goal in mind, to bring to the table high level executives, successful entrepreneurs, and just all around inspiring human beings. Not just focusing on their success, but more important, shining a spotlight on the road they traveled to get there. Now this week's guest, I'm so happy to have him in the building. He is an author, a real estate and business mogul, and the founder of the Tulsa Real Estate Fund. Please welcome to this week's Power Move Maker series, Mr. Jay Morrison. Jay, what up? Hey, peace, Kane. What's good with you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Thanks for taking the time out. <clears throat> I think our audience can learn a lot from you. Um, you know, and Jay, we were just talking offline, and you you've experienced extremely high level success. And with high level success, many times a lot of pressure comes with that, a lot of public scrutiny, and you are right. no stranger to that. So I want to go into your backstory and then we'll bring it up to date and you know just try to clear some of the misconceptions that might be out there, okay? We can rock out. We can we, we can cover the misconceptions and we can cover the uh the the the, the facts and the and the history and the impact. We can cover all that. Well, fair enough. We're gonna get it straight from the horse's mouth. Jay, I know a lot of people <clears throat> know your backstory, but can you go into that briefly for anybody who's watching it or listening to this that might not know how you came um up to let's just give it to where you started in real estate. Gotcha. So, um, man, started in real estate. First introduction even to the word real estate was in 1998 in Baltimore, Maryland, uh, what we call one of my big homies. I was uh, uh, a few years in as a 10-year uh, dope boy, started selling drugs at 15 years old. And, and while in Maryland, where I would bring some ounces down from New Jersey and New York, um, one of my guys, Kenny uh, Bird, and he's now the one of the popular figure in Maryland, in Baltimore. Kenny Bird was one of kind of my, my big homies. He was bringing me to the east side of Baltimore. I just bought a new bracelet to match a, a blue face of Mariner Rolex I had. And he said, Slim, you can buy all the cars and jewelry you want, but God ain't making no more land. <laughs> and he, he had me on a block in east Baltimore, and he was showing me all the drug transactions, all the dope cars, all the big chains, and all of that. And he was just like, you can always recreate that stuff. You can always make new Gucci and new Louis. But your God ain't making no more land. Whoever owns the most land wins. So that's my first introduction to the concept of real estate. And you know me, I heard it as a 17-year-old, 18-year-old kid. And I'm like, all right, cool, dope. And I went out and bought more coke, right? I went out and bought more, bought more clothes. Um, but that seed planted then um, transformed in 1999 after serving a year in prison, upstate New York, Rikers Island, also Montre Upper, um, C74 building. I went upstate New York for uh, getting caught for a quarter kilo of coke and a loaded handgun. Um, I did that year in prison, came home on a work release program in Harlem, uh, then went to New Jersey. When I came home, my mom said, Maine, I'm looking to buy a house. Um, I'm three grand short for the down payment. Can you help me? I told my mom, go in my Timberland shoebox. I said, I got you. My mom got three racks and she went and closed on a $100,000 house in Somerville, New Jersey. Um, that was our family first property after growing up on Section 8, growing up on government housing, growing up on welfare, growing up on WIC. My mom really pressed to get us out of that situation, six of us living in a two-bedroom to own our own home. Mm -hmm. So that home was my first real estate transaction, actually. So um, people don't know that at uh, 19 years old, coming from prison, I was the cash partner, the equity partner, we call it these days, for my mom to acquire that, uh, that home. That property went up in value $100,000 in four years with no renovations. I literally trapped out the house. Um, it was right on the block, but we owned it. And through supply and demand, what we call appreciation, the property went up in value. And um, years later, we were able to leverage that to buy more real estate uh, for our family. Um, I got serious about, or ser more seriously introduced into real estate after serving another prison sentence for a year and a half in Eastern Correctional Institution in Annandale, uh, in, in Maryland, and then get extradited to Annandale, New Jersey prison in Jersey for drug trafficking in Maryland at 20 uh, years old. Um, I was uh, on a parole program at 22, where I was actually introduced to the mortgage industry and became a loan officer for the first time, um, uh, when Pastor Thomas saw some uh, potential in me. From my charisma, he said, you're well-spoken. He said, you know, we're, we're in this men's group on Saturdays, right, on this uh, ISP, Intense Supervision Parole. And he said, listen, um, I want you to try something new, try something different. And he referred me to this mortgage company, Flexible Benefits Mortgage Company in Plainfield, New Jersey, 
where they taught me mortgages for the first time. And I was able to close my first two refinances, one from my grandmother, one from my aunt, and actually made my first money in real estate, which was $6,000 in like two months um, off of pushing mortgages. I got more stories to tell, but I'll stop there so you can do your job and ask some questions. Okay, great backstory. I appreciate that. When I first came to know your name, it was through, actually, I think I saw you on BT. I'm, I'm not sure what year that was. But, you know, 2006, 2007, maybe. Yeah, it, it was definitely in the early 2000s. So that was the first time I ever was introduced to you. And I was introduced to you as a celebrity realtor. And it was kind of like a lifestyle of the rich and famous or what now would be considered, I don't know, um, million dollar listings or something like that. How did you go from doing these small transactions with your family to blowing up and making your way on the BET? How did that even come about? Yeah, so uh, correction on that. That was actually 2012 on NBC. I was on NBC okay. doing Open House uh, NYC, which was a TV show that NBC would have on, on Sunday mornings. Um, I mentioned BT in 2006, 2007, because after that 2002 mortgage days I just told you about, mm -hmm. well, I went back to the trap after I graduated the pro program, hustled for a few more years, but in 2005, walked away from the dope game um, on South 10th and Springfield in North New Jersey, and I got into real estate full time. That's when I became a landlord. That's when I became a uh, homeowner. That's when I began to flip properties, develop properties, end up managing mortgage companies. I became a realtor for the first time in 2005. And I parlayed that success, making my first million by 28 in 2008, to then later on, after a bunch of other stories in 2012, you would see me on NBC working for Southern Beats International Realty as a celebrity realtor. Um, so doing that show on NBC, also as a real estate expert on NBC's Today Show, um, and as a multi-million dollar real estate lister as a realtor, but still with a back history of being an investor and developer. So there's a lot of um, my journey, my tenure, my experiences. Right. I go on days about all I've done in the business. So when you were introduced to me on NBC, I had already been on BET no, I was actually, I was actually, I was because I was confusing the two. I did see both, but when I was first okay. introduced to you, was actually on BET, and then later yeah. on, that's when I first started yeah. to know your name. Right. So BET, that was a show called Transformations, and it did a story of my life transformation in 2006. Mm -hmm. That was my first introduction to being like a brand, and then I won the Rock Aware I Would Not Lose contest uh, in 2007, eight. I had a billboard in Vegas, a billboard in Times Square, was in Vibe Magazine. And then, right, so that was my early brand days before even being a brand was like even, to yep. me, was an own thing, right? I'm just, you know, out here hustling. Um, and so then years later, yes, I would be found on NBC as a real estate expert and celebrity realtor. So are you still licensed as an agent? No, no. I did away with that uh, almost 10 years ago. Okay. Well, I would say probably almost six years ago, seven years ago. Okay, so today, even though, I mean, you're doing much bigger and better things, so you're not licensed currently? No. Talk to me, and I like to go deep, and you know, our audience are comprised of people who are trying to do better with their lives, move up mm -hmm. in their companies, uh, create businesses, or just take their businesses to the next level. Talk to me about, because it was difficult, you lived through 08, 09, 10, 11, 12, those were very, very difficult years for real estate. How did it affect you and your company? Um, it affected me that I changed my whole entire hustle. I changed my whole entire business model off of it. I didn't get beat up from a perspective of um, a lot of foreclosures, a lot of the properties I have being caught with them because I got rid of them early. But the industry that paid me, which was mortgages, which was you know um, real estate investing, um, the well was running dry. It was like, you can't do loans no more. You can't get financing anymore. Like, you know, it was like in prior to that, it was like you was printing money, but now everything had frozen up. And so me being a hustler, cause I saw myself not as a real estate guy, nor did I see myself as a drug dealer. I was a hustler, I could hustle anything. So I then began to look at pursue other careers. I got a record label at that time, had an R&B artist, was taking meetings at Atlantic with Gene Nelson, um, Gabby Brooks at SRC, and I'm running around hustling this R&B kid, uh, doing party promotions. I was doing everything I could. I, I partnered in a staffing agency, doing different things I could to just produce revenue while the, the market was, was hard. Um, but as I was trying to build my brand and find my lane, um, one of my early mentors, Emory Jones, was like, yo, 
why you, you know, in music, everybody do music. He was like, nobody does real estate. He was like, do what you do best. And that was like 2011, 2012. And that's when I actually re-got my license, got back into the business and began to grind up back my brand and my business. Okay, is this the same Emory Jones that runs with um, Jay-Z? Yeah, Emory. Okay, Emory. good. So I want to ask you just about that period again, because even in doing research, and I'd just like you to address this, even in doing research for this interview, some woman uh, alleged to be your ex says during that period of time, it was very difficult. You guys were living in a foreclosed property, any of all of yeah, that stuff. But yeah, it, I, was, I was broke. I, I, I was broke. I, was flat. I had no car. My, my 750 was repossessed. I was borrowing money from my mom. Me and her was hustling. She was my party promoter friend. She was my homegirl that was at the club on stage with me while we promoting parties, promoting at strip clubs, grinding it up and, and, and trapping away without me trapping, without me going back to what I knew best outside of real estate. So yeah, that, that was that was my, my my running mate. We had all, you know, that was my homegirl. That was my like that was my that was my homegirl, right? So there is truth, there is truth to 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 her version of of you guys' life together during that period. I, I never heard her version. I heard I hear the gossip. I never actually heard her direct versions. I don't know what to give truth to, but I've always told in my story that I went I went broke. I, I went bankrupt. I had no car. I was uh uh, borrowing money from the ATM overdraft. Like, I don't like that's part of my story. I'm not running from that. You like, know, I, I want to bring guess what? That, I that, bring guess this what? Out. Uh, I'm yeah. sorry, go ahead. No, nah, I'm saying, like, that's dope. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm not running from that, bro. Like, I come from poverty, I come from nothing. I'm not scared of nothing. But what I'm showing everybody is that without me going back to selling drugs, I was able to grind back up to run a global real estate enterprise and activate one of the largest active group economics we've ever seen in any generation of our culture, in real life, and run an Inc. 500, twice Inc. 500, number 588 fastest growing the company's educational company, top 10 in the country, and become a three-time author, two-time best-selling author from nothing, from overdraft fees, from broke, from bankrupt, from living in foreclosure, playing the game because I knew the foreclosure laws and knew I could live for free. Yeah, that was me. Got you. Okay. Tell so, me. What's up? <laughs> it, it, and I'm going to be honest with you. I wanted to shoot that out there because no matter what, right? You hear the rumors. We all hear the rumors. But that's part of your journey. It's nothing to be ashamed of. If you weren't doing well during those times, a lot of people lost properties during those times. Bro, people, people killed themselves during those times. What are you talking about? People jumped off of buildings during those times. What are you talking about? I made millions by 28 out of the trap. No college education, high school dropout. Went broke again after being broke growing up. Made millions, went broke again, and then bounced back and got it all back. What are you talking about? Okay. To all my movers, if you love educational and inspirational content just like this, please like, comment, and subscribe to this channel. But most important, if you know anybody making power moves just like you, share it. Now back to the video. So talk to me, more controversy around the same period. It could be a little later though. Um, lawsuit brought against you about two, from two former partners. Mm -hmm. I believe this is somewhere in the area 2015, 2014. In terms no. of real estate, they were according, alleged, well I go according to the paperwork. Mm -hmm. You guys had a property together. You I'm must say this about that. Go ahead. We settled, we settled it. We, we had a business dispute. Can, can, can we talk about it? Which happens in business. No, there's confidentiality around it. What I'm saying we had a business dispute in business. They felt one way about the business. I felt one way about the business. We went through that business dispute and that lawsuit, and we ended up settling it. It took years, but we settled it. So as it stands business today, huh? as, it sta as it stands today, that case is settled. It's settled. Okay. Business Beautiful. done. That's part of business. I, you can't be in business 20 years and have no business disputes. You wasn't really doing business then. Name an entrepreneur you know that's never had a business dispute. No, you're, 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 you're accurate. But now, now I just want to declare the air up on certain things because there's certain things being used to, uh, for lack of a better word, come after your character, come after the way you do business. You're right. I'm an entrepreneur. There's a million entrepreneurs out there 
and everybody is not going to have the best experience with you. Mm -hmm. So moving forward, during I say this, that the, the case you're referencing mm -hmm. was business from 2000. What everybody's talking about is business from 2007. I just want to say that. It wasn't 2014. It wasn't 2018. It was business from 2007. Is that when you went into business with these with these two? Yes, yeah, so you do your research and you read your paperwork. I don't right. It's 2007 was the business dispute. It went on for years disputing about it, but the business matter you're referencing and anybody's referencing that matter is from 2007 when I was 27 years old. I'm 40 years old. 2007, which is like how many? 14 years ago. Correct. And it's set, either way, it's still settled. My point is, you're talking about something that's 14 years old. Uh, question, before I leave this topic. Were mm -hmm. you found guilty of fraud? No. No. Not at all. One thousand percent. You can't pull up anything, anything, anywhere that says I was found guilty of fraud. You ain't got to ask me that. You can look at all the paperwork. I did look at the paperwork. I did, did look at the paperwork, and the lawyer kind of highlighted some of the lines you. are blurry. Some of the lines are blurry, but... No, no. No, not blurry, pretty much black and white. When you're guilty for fraud, it pretty much says you're guilty for fraud. Did you see anything that said I was guilty for fraud? Uh, I'm not a, I'm not a- No, it's, 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 it's a yes or no. Something to the effect that-, that No, what, it's, it's a yes or no, family. Family, it's a yes or no. Guilty is guilty. Ain't it all effects to it. Okay, if you, you, you're on the streets, obviously. So, no, so if- No, if, I'm, I'm, I'm just asking you. Go ahead, which, which question? Did you- see anything in any document, any paperwork ever that said Jay Morrison was found guilty of fraud? No, I did not see those words exactly. No. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay, so going through that period. Great questions, by the way. Say that again? Say great questions, by the way. Yeah, yeah I mean, it, it, again, you know, my platform is to... Uh, it I'll deserves to be asked. asked. But I gotta ask. It deserves ask. to be asked. Bro, I deserve to be vetted. I don't mind. Is from the position in which you're coming from. I don't sense that there's any malice in what you're coming from. You just absolutely want the not. Truth. I'm cool with the truth. What I'm not cool with is people that couldn't even answer that question I just gave you. Like if you didn't say no to that question, I would have to end the interview. Because it means you're not even being truthful. We're not even being honest. I'm being honest with you, but you can't even be honest with me because you just want to allude to something. Correct. All right. So the facts are I've never been found guilty of no fraud. I, you know what I'm saying? So it's like. You can't say that. Nobody can say that. Okay. Around that same period of time, you did file for bankruptcy. Was that in order not to pay these defendants? Or was it just because it was a rough time in your business life? I was filing bankruptcy because, it was, what, your last point, it was a rough time in my business life, as I already mentioned. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I want to talk about your academy. Sure. Let's talk about One that. second. Can you, t why don't you take it from here? Talk to us about your academy. How did it come into play? You're a guy, you're going through very, very difficult times. Uh, you're not the only investor in real estate. Correct. Put this out there. That was affected by the, the only 09, 10 recession. Right. You're one of millions. Facts. Where does the idea for the academy come from, number one? And... You being on your behind at that time, why did you see yourself as a person who could come out as an expert and create an academy? Because ultimately that's saying, I'm extremely successful and I'm gonna teach you how to be extremely successful. No, it says, um, right, you know, academy is based on what? Education. Education, correct. So what it says is I'm extremely knowledgeable and I'm knowledgeable enough to show you how to maneuver through this industry because of my, my extreme knowledge and my experiences, right? Mm -hmm. So how it came about was I was working at Sotheby's, I was on NBC, I was doing Celebrity Realtor, I was listing homes, I was facilitating real estate transactions, getting back, acclimating the business, what Emory said, be, the, be do what you do best. So I'm building that up. I dropped a World Star interview, uh, a world star uh, wake up video that yep. went viral, Breakfast Club interview that went viral, and people were like, "Yo, I want you to mentor me. I want you know what I mean, like be my apprentice. I want to learn from you. Know I, mean? I want to learn from you. I want to know the game. Like you inspired me. Your story coming from the streets and coming from the trap it inspired me, right? So all that happened, 
And um, I'm getting like thousands of emails. I'm like, yo, I can't, I want to mentor everybody. I want to show them how to beat the trap, but like, I can't do that. So I was like, well, how do you automate all this knowledge I have and what I learned? How do you systemize that, right? I didn't understand the word and know the word curriculum at that time, because I mean, again, I, I graduated high school from an alternative program. I'm a smart guy. I didn't go to college, so I didn't know about curriculum and educational pedagogy and all these things I know now about education, right? But I knew I had a gift of leadership and a lot of charisma and I had a lot of knowledge and I was willing to share it and I had a heart for our community. So simultaneously, while you saw me on NBC, Mm -hmm. I also was doing free financial literacy in like over 30 schools between North New Jersey, Brooklyn, New York, and like around the country. So I was teaching a program called Hip Hop to Homeowners. Yep. So I was teaching kids in high school about how to increase their credit score, what a mortgage was, what real estate was, right? And I was trying to, basically I was like, how could I have saved me from all the 10 years you know, in the streets, two and a half years in prison and all that? How could I have saved me? And I was like, well, if somebody would have put me on game and really broke down how credit works and leverage works and real estate works earlier with my natural hustle, I could have did something different other than sold drugs for 10 years. So I did the program, Hip Hop to Homeowners, to really give back to us, to give early game in a fun, relatable way in financial literacy. So I hold these big concerts, hundreds of kids, like 400, 500 kids, like Malcolm X Bass High School, uh, the Lean On Me School, Pass New Jersey, East Side High. Like going to all these high schools, I'll bring a DJ, DJ Little Man. We'll have dance contests, we'll have t-shirts, all of that, credit score signs, Monopoly signs. <coughs> But I would teach our youth about real estate early, right? So as I saw my gift, like I'm able to translate this from stage. I got like a thousand kids locked in. Nobody snickering, making jokes. You know what I'm saying? Like I saw I had a gift to captivate and to teach. Mm-hmm. And literally 16 and 17 year olds would come after me after like, yo, I really understood what you were saying. And then even their t- teachers would be like, yo, I don't even know that about credit, Right. So, 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 so I literally shed a tear my first one, which is Carteret High School in Carteret, New Jersey. And I saw I had this gift of teaching and I saw my purpose. Like my purpose wasn't about flipping houses. My purpose was flipping people, flipping our culture. Like I felt it like, yo, God got something bigger for you than just you being a man and doing real estate. Like Brock, I really like to, to, for instance, fast forward a little bit. I, in my Jay Morrison Academy, we do something called a corner class where I teach on inner city street corners. Yep. Bro, I'm, we had 700 people outside in the Bronx, New York, outside learning real estate, locked in for three hours on Marcy Ave in Brooklyn, Fordham Road in the Bronx, right? Little Haiti in Miami, all over the country, Chicago, Madison Pulaski in the west side, Murder Mac and Bewick on the east side of Detroit. Hundreds outside learning from my, from my knowledge, from my experiences and my successes and my failures, right? So again, this gift I found I had to teach. I translated it from high schools to online digitally. When that uh, request for people to, for me to mentor and teach them came, I was trying to figure out how can I package it? How can I automate it? (coughs) Excuse me. So then in 2014 is when I um, founded the Academy. It was like, yo, I could package this. I could put this together and we're putting this together I believe that I can reach more people. And for that, we have millions educated, over 300,000 enrolled and all the other stats, 65 free corner classes all over the country. Okay, how many did you, did you say are enrolled currently? Currently, uh, probably three, 4,000 over the history of our school, three, over 300,000. Over the history of the school, over 300,000, great. Uh, what's the success rate of your school? There's no metrics to define the exact success rate. Like, there's not like a, a pass fail grade that you get. What you get is, <clears throat> the, dang, hold on. <clears throat> and for that matter, and, and I totally understand where you're going. Are there any testimonials or success stories that you know of of people who started with your course and have come out and um, were able to do really, really big business in real estate? And we have thousands of people who have had success owning homes, starting businesses. We literally have, <coughs> what is it, Dusty in here? <coughs> Excuse me. One second. We literally have had, had thousands of business owners, <coughs> thousands of homeowners, thousands of those who have boosted their credit 
I mean, the impact is immeasurable. I mean, I can't even, it's immeasurable. Got you. So the school starts in 2014. You obviously have a gift <laughs> in that area. Uh, you know, me watching you over the years and even having this conversation right now, you're well-spoken, very articulate, very knowledgeable. So I could easily see an online curriculum, an online academy doing well for you. Absolutely. Uh, so I want to talk because again, with 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 high level success, it always comes with uh, a lot of public scrutiny. You you have an ex partner, um, and I don't even know he he claims he's just ex partner. A guy named Rod, Rod uh, Stand Back. Stand Back is that is that how you pronounce his name? Mm -hmm. yep. Is is this an actual ex partner of yours? He's an ex partner. Yep. Okay, can you talk to, you know, I've watched some of the interviews that he, he's done, and um, he has, I guess, his version of what was going on. He wasn't being paid his share. He opted to, to get out of the academy. Um, you, at the time, didn't own any real estate. Is there any truth to anything that he is alleging? Um, I didn't hear his interview, so I can't give full truth to his interview. Uh -huh. He was an ex-partner. Um, he decided to part ways. We parted ways. Have had no conversations since he parted ways. Not one. Not a, you owe me, I owe you. I said, all right, bro. God bless you. I'm going to keep it moving. And um, my perspective is he didn't think that we would win. He didn't believe in the model anymore. Whatever it was. I don't even, it doesn't even matter. Is that he decided to part ways. He parted ways. And we kept it moving. Um, at that time, I don't think that I had any real estate assets at that time, other than the house that I was in that was in foreclosure at that time. Understood. Mm -hmm. When you guys parted ways, was it on good terms? Was it because it's not like he from from the interviews I've watched, mm -hmm. he, he seems to be a very level headed guy. From from, and I don't want to speak for him. I can only talk from the interviews that I've watched of him in preparation for this interview. He seems to be very level-headed. He gives me the sense that uh, he didn't feel as though the money was being equally split. Let's just put it that way. Uh, he, I'll tell you this, as a, um, his business principle was that every month, every quarter, or literally monthly, that we split any revenue that came into the business. My principle was you got to have reserve for the business, the savings for the business, and we're growing a new business from scratch. He wanted from the rip, like it was like a uh, drug transaction, like you we made a flip, you bust it down. Mm -hmm. I'm like, we can't grow the business that way. We disagree with that. And the brother, he had the, uh, the PayPal account in his name. He shut down a PayPal account. He took the reserves of the PayPal account. And he said, I'm done. I said, cool. He took all the money. <laughs> he shut down the account. I restarted the organization. We uh, dissolved that company, that LLC. I restarted my own and we kept it moving. Okay, in all fairness to him, again, he's not here. I'm only, so you're only getting his side of the story from me, which is yeah. one-sided, right? Correct. So he, he's- but, And honestly, I'm only sharing this with you just to have one moment of truth and transparency, but bro, this stuff is like 10 years old. And, and I'm saying this too. The brother never said nothing to me. We don't got no pending suits, no pending disputes. He took it as his time to come out and have some, I don't even know. I can't even speak for him. My whole point is like, we like way past that. You know what I'm saying? Like way past that. Like he, he got his- The way I love story. to do the interviews is chronologically bringing your story up to date. So yes, it- I feel you know. and, that's why, and that's why I'm really having this dialogue, which, which yep. I have never had with nobody, as far as like just, Give me the whole thing all out. And as honestly, I'm saving most of it for my book, uh, but I'm just giving it to you today. Like, share, yeah, share what you're willing to share because we're going to bring it up to date. So, so if we want to stop there, I'm fine with it. Yeah. Um, again, if, if, if uh, you guys split, it was amicable. You restart the, um, the company, different LLC. We can keep it moving. Yes. Yeah, keep moving. Yeah. So where does the, the idea, because I want to bring it up to um, somewhere in there, while I go backwards. 
At what point does this idea, which I think is a phenomenal idea, it is it is so forward thinking and it is, uh, you know, you have the ability to dream big, obviously. It's revolutionary, the idea. It actually pioneered the whole financial literacy movement that we see today. Correct. In a lot of ways, especially in our community. And I'm not just saying that. I mean, you could go to multiple podcasts. You could ask Wall Street Trapper, earn your leisure, Derek Grace. Brother Benet, 19 Keys, a bunch of other people, they'll, they'll tell you uh, a large part of who, you know, our input and our impact. Where does the idea from the Tulsa, for the Tulsa Real Estate Fund come from? It came from uh, a series of things. First, this idea like, oh, we have an audience and I was looking to raise capital for uh, some deals early on, like 2014, 2015. And I put out an Instagram post, like, hey, I'm looking at some properties, um, who would like to be a part of them, uh, hit DM me. I got mad DMs, mad emails. I'm like, oh, snap. And then my attorney was like, you can't raise capital that way. You can't, like, publicly raise capital unless you have certain blue sky law filings and certain regulations follow. So we never did anything with that. I was like, okay, cool. Um, I was mentored and partnered with uh, a white guy um, at Long Island who was very successful in the multifamily space, and he was raising a lot of capital through Reg D's, which is typically for accredited investors. And I'm like, well, I don't got a bunch sake of, of our audience. Stop for one second. I'm sorry to interject. Explain the difference between accredited and non-accredited investors before we sure. move on. Yeah. So non-accredited investors are those who make less than a quarter million a year or have a net worth of less than $1 million. And at one point, it was $2 million. Accredited investors are those who have a net worth of $1 million or more or make over a quarter million a year. So Chris was raising capital from a bunch of accredited investors in Long Island, right? People that had 250 or more a year or net worth over a million. I'm like, I don't got a bunch of those people in my network, but I do have a large audience. Like that's my equity. That's my, um, you know, opportunity. So he and I were talking about how we could do that. And I started researching with attorneys maybe in 2015 about how that could be executed. And there were all these different kinds of regulations and tiers and, all that. Um, didn't necessarily go anywhere at the time. Uh, rewind to 2007, six, seven, when I was managing two mortgage companies in Union, New Jersey, playing for New Jersey, I'm a real estate financing expert, period. Um, in that time, all the money that we would borrow, we would get was always from Jews, from Russians, or some like other ethnicity, right? We have these meetings, we'd go to them for our warehouse line and get capital and all this stuff. And I always was like, yo, what if we just came together and put our money together? We could buy these hotels. We could buy hospitals. We could buy this. I was like, what if Young Jeezy and what if this one and what if that one, uh, these rappers, these entertainers all put their money together? They could own more, right? This is back in 2006, 2007. Before this was like even nothing like what it is today. I was just seeing the opportunity as I'm on the MLS. I, mean, I was around all kinds of deals and I was seeing all the other communities take down all the assets. We were doing our thing, but we wasn't doing it like they were doing their thing. You know what I mean? Like I'm watching these Jewish groups in Lakewood, New Jersey, come buy up whole, you know, complexes and assets and strip malls and all that. So I thought about that on. I'm telling you all this because this is how Treff came into play. Mm -hmm. All these experiences led to the Tulsa Real Estate Fund. So me thinking back then, to, like, like that in 2006, 2007, me seeing the opportunity uh, to raise capital through social media in 2014, from me then seeing the opportunity to... Um, syndicate through non-accredited investors in 2015, 2016, uh, 15, then Freddie Gray happened in Baltimore. And I was put into motion spiritually and universally to take action. I drove from New Jersey down to Baltimore. I rented a red megaphone from Party City. I went to North and Penn where they burned down the CVS. And I just like, bro, I never, that was like my first act of like, uh, second act of activism. My first one was Alpha Wright in Hempville, Texas, where I was then mentored by sister Krista Muhammad from the New Black Panther Party. That's my mentor, socially, uh, consciously. And I was then told to read Mal uh, Malcolm X's book and, and, and studied about, or a bullet, Malcolm X's speech and learned about Cointel Pro and our oppression and all that. So that became, the, that's where the activist Jay Morrison was born. So I went to Baltimore, um, organically ended up leading a protest of like a thousand people down to City Hall because I had a big red megaphone, it was loud. And CNN interviewed me, Wolf Blitzer, Anderson Cooper, all that. And then BET bust a, 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 a busload of Bloods and Crips up to uh, with Tamika Mallory, my sister Tamika Mallory, my son, the general, and other activists at the time, 
bust us up to a uh, BT headquarters in New York to do this community solutions panel with Mark Lamont Hill and cousin Jeff and all them. During that panel, I'm on the panel and somebody in the crowd was like, we need to build a black wall street, yo. And I was like, yo, if y'all talking economics, anybody want to build a black wall street, see me after I'll be over there. And after they all came up to me and I spent three months on the ground building with Bloods and Crips in Baltimore, community leaders, my now pastor, who I didn't even know at the time, Jamal Bryant, started building with Tamika Mallory and my song. That's how we built our brotherhood and sisterhood and just went to work. Just went to work. We're like, yo, if our community, if community is in disarray, if our community, as Malcolm said, is suffering from political oppression, economic exploitation, social degradation, um, as Marcus Garvey says, it's not the white man's job to take care of us. It's our job to take care of us. It's their job to take care of their race. That's how Marcus Garvey looked at it. I'm a Garveyite. I'm a Pan-Africanist. This is me. So all that led to me thinking about my experience trying to raise capital before, my mortgage days experience and all that. And like, well, how, if we're going to build a black Wall Street, we need our own institutions. It's not about just buying a bunch of real estate. It's about controlling the capital, influencing the capital and having our own treasury institutions. So I went back to my attorneys, told them my idea and concept. Coincidentally, at that time, President Obama had passed the Jobs Act, which then made it uh, available for non-accredited investors to invest with accredited investors through the Jobs Act, through reggae funds. And I started doing a research and development for it in 2015, 2016, formed the LLC Tulsa Real Estate Fund, and began our SEC filing to have what is now the first Black-owned real estate crowdfund in the history of America. Beautiful, beautiful. Uh, for anybody who doesn't know, why did you name it Tulsa? Why, why not name it the Jay Morrison uh, Real Estate Fund? Because it was bigger than me. I mean, all of it, even my businesses that have my name are still bigger than me, but this was inspired by the community of Black Wall Street. Black Wall Street was called Greenwood in the community of Tulsa or city of Tulsa, Oklahoma. Quick history lesson, Black Wall Street was founded in 1905 by O.W. Gurley, our, our, the founder of Black Wall Street. He was a Mississippi entrepreneur that bought 40 acres of land in Tulsi Town, the early name of Tulsa, Oklahoma. He then bust down that 40 acres of land with J.B. Stafford, and they began to build what was mildly known in the next 15 years as Black Wall Street, which was 36 square blocks of over 2,000 homes and businesses, all black owned, bus lines, movie theaters, hospitals, schools, churches, insurance companies, bars, all that black owned. Um, and we named our fund um, in the spirit of that community and in homage of that community. I didn't want to go to the SEC, the federal government, with a Black Wall Street fund. I didn't think that was going to fly. So Tulsa Real Estate Fund was always code word Black Wall Street. Understood. Uh, again, you keep mentioning SEC and we'll get there. And I think it's important, like how much paperwork, how much uh, back end producing of uh, financials, producing to make sure, because I, I want to establish that this is an extremely credible, or I want you to establish that this is an extremely credible fund. You it's talk about good. this, this idea came and started getting moving around 2016, correct? Yes. But you, you opened it up for your IPO around June 1st, 2018. 2018. Yes. To two years of paperwork. Um, it, the SEC is a Security and Exchange Commission. It's the federal government's Security and Exchange Commission. The United States of America Federal Government Security and Exchange Commission, which essentially regulates um, part of the finance industry. It qualifies companies for registration to be able to raise capital and do other kind of uh, functions like that. And so... Um, yes, we went through all the paperwork. We went through what most of us and most entrepreneurs don't want to go through, right? Um, going through long piles of paperwork and time. And I just believed in it and I, I grinded it out. Um, but yes, I mean, to your point, it is, I mean, most it, of your it, public it, companies it. go through, I mean, all your public companies go through the SEC. Every public company you know, every major public company you know in America that is a public company that raises capital um, and private funds, they all go through the SEC. Understood. Uh, June 1st, 18, you open it up to a crowdfunding. Um, I'm, I'm assuming this is the, the equation of a first round of funding, correct? Why yeah, not go- It was our first raise, yep. Yep. 
why not go, and this is your IPO, why not go through a, the traditional routes of NASDAQ, New York Stock Exchange? You did it very, very different. Was it just so that you can take advantage of the audience that you have built up? Was it just to make sure that people who come from the inner city, and I don't want to answer this for you. Yeah. Um, no, I can tell you. Go ahead. One, um, it's very expensive to go through a NASDAQ or exchange and go through offering a, a public company to a public IPO is very, very expensive. It's, it's five or six times as expensive and even more paperwork, more vigorous. It is just, it is the NBA. It is, it is, it is the, not even the NBA, it's the NBA all-star game of business. And again, it's a very expensive thing and I wasn't ready for that. And, and through council, I wasn't ready for that. And we didn't need that to, to do that to accomplish our goal. Are there more regulations on that side? Um, I know I it's know. more expensive, but, but are there more, is it more eyes watching to make sure that every dollar is accounted for? You're still dealing with no, the federal not, government, no, I know. It, it, no, no, it's not that. That's not, no, don't imply that. All, all of us who are in that space have to have third party auditors mm -hmm. and have to have our financial reviews and, and all that. So it's not about dollars being accounted for whatsoever. Oh, so, uh, okay. Yeah, it, it, it has nothing to do with dollars being accounted for. Um, it could be have more heavily regulated as a public company, um, just in general, uh, potentially, yeah, but it's not about dollars being accounted for, as if in Reg A funds, dollars aren't accounted for. Okay, in, in, in your initial public offering, how much did you raise? Um, 8.5 million the first several months. You said over the first seven months? Several months, whatever it was. I, I'm not exactly sure where. Um, okay, beautiful. It was. It's, it's actually a great number. Um, raising- 11.3 million altogether. Over say it one more time. Over 11.3 million altogether, but the first raise, eight point, a little over 8.5. Okay. Raising that type of money, how big is your staff? Um, uh, and then and now, then between staff and vendors, probably anywhere from a dozen to fifteen people on staff and vendors, maybe even up to twenty. Are we talking now today? Today, probably about the same thing, about ten to a dozen. Okay. Uh, you raise out the gate over $8 million in total, over $11 million. How many investors are we looking at? In total, we're 15,000 investors. Total in our organization, 14,224 to date. How many shares of the company um, have you sold off so far? Over 222,000 shares. And the goal is to sell up to how many? No, our, our capital raise is closed. The capital, really? Yeah. So you're not going to have another round? Um, not this time. We have a we have an exit strategy plan, but no more rounds. No, we're closed for now. With that money, how much uh, property has been bought? How many assets are owned by the fund at this moment? Um, well, it's not all owned because we also are a private lender and a syndication partner mm -hmm. as well, right? So we just don't go. That's your background. We say, yes, absolutely. So I'm sitting here at the Legacy Center, our Class A office space, 30,000 square foot building, 2.6 acre campus. It's one of our assets. Uh, we currently have a 98 unit apartment complex in Macon, Georgia. Currently have, have collateralized out seven units in uh, New Orleans on Myra Street, a bundle mortgage in Cincinnati, another mortgage out of Nashville, 14 unit mortgage out in uh, Lake Charles, Louisiana. Uh, uh, and that, oh, yeah, and that might be it currently. Okay. If, if I'm an investor at this, and I, and I watch interviews with you in the past, so I don't know if it's changed, so I'll just ask. If I'm an investor and I wanted to sell my shares currently, is there a process? Can I sell it immediately as though, as though I was in NASDAQ or, or a regular exchange? Or is there a no, you can't. There, there's no There's no exchange market for uh, shares in, in these private 
funds. Mm-hmm. Um, you can uh, ask for a redemption, and then you go through your redemption policy. Um, from the fact of selling the shares, we are working on an actual portal where, because a lot of people still want to invest. It's like the question you asked, can I still invest? So we constantly get those requests. So we are working on a portal where those who want to redeem shares um, can actually meet people that want to invest. And there is a process where you can, they can, our investors can sell their shares on their own in a private way, but there's certain steps they have to follow. So we are working on systemizing and automating those steps. So they were actually creating a private market for them to be able to essentially sell their shares. But there is not an open market uh, like a NASDAQ that they can sell their shares at this level of our company. Okay. Uh, at this point in, in the company, and again, I just, like if Sean, if I bought, if I had shares in the company, if I wanted to sell it on my own to maybe a cousin or a friend or, or somebody else who currently owns shares, I could do that. But if I just wanted to get back, uh, put it back out there to the public, I couldn't. At this point, no, you cannot. Can you talk to me the difference? I know it's crowdfunded. Uh, is that the same as a GoFundMe or is it, is, is it something different? It's absolutely something different. Um, Can you explain it, the differences? Because when I think, and again, I, you know, I'm coming from the outside looking in. How, how is it different from a GoFundMe? Well, GoFundMe is a donation account. You're, you're donating money. This is an equity fund. You're investing money and you're getting partnership. You're getting equity in our company, you're getting shares of the company. You're actually an owner in our company. So our 15,000 plus members, mm-hmm. their families have all been commercial real estate owners, apartment complex owners, private lenders. They have created over 100 jobs that our company has done. Everything that we've done, they have done, right? As owners and equity partners in the company. They also, you have a 8% preferred return that accrues, so uh, that accumulates. So our investors, as you may know, have just been paid a dividend, which means that on a GoFundMe, you don't get paid anything back. You get the right on, man. You might get a T-shirt. And our fund, our investors get uh, a dividend payment upon profitability within the company or upon equity in the company. So um, that's the difference. Ownership is the difference between a GoFundMe and being a member and partner in our, our fund. Okay, this is a great answer because there's a lot of people who, who do not know the nuance. They do not know the difference. I know. So well explained. Let's talk dividends for, for a second. And I'm going to read to you what, what I dug up as the definition of a dividend. Mm-hmm. A dividend is a sum of money regularly and it's regularly paid, typically quarterly, by a company to its shareholders out of its profits. Correct? Mm-hmm. Would you agree with that? Have you guys been profitable? Has the Tulsa Real Estate Fund been profitable? Because I know that you just paid around the dividends out. So are you profitable? Holistically, as a company, we are not. But when you look at our circular and you look at our agreement and our dividend um, and distribution definition, it is, uh, and because the way our fund is structured, we can pay from the profits or revenues generated from specific, from specific assets provided the company has the amount of right amount of capital reserves that the manager approves that the company is healthy enough to do so and that it, it that the money is accessible and is there from a transaction right so as we're doing different real estate transactions the company itself as a whole institution may not be uh, profitable but from those transactions if we have the right amount of capital reserves And if we have the right amount of equity there, and if it fits all those things, it's probably something I'm missing that I'll I'll disclose in that. But if we have that there, we can pay a distribution to our members. And our investors, it's all in our investor reports, all in our investor communications, it's all in our circular. Is this public knowledge or is it only available to your investors? Um, No, anyone can go to sec.gov and search the EGRA report and you can read our entire filing. You can just go to the section on dividends and capital distributions. Have you ever had any problems with the SEC since launching? The SEC and the DOJ, the Federal United States Department of Justice, they both launched an investigation on our fund in January of 2019. Uh, About an 18-month long investigation from two federal agencies, the SEC and the DOJ. 
The SEC is civil. They don't look at criminal things. They look at civil things to see if that there were any civil uh, mishaps, right, or misappropriations or anything like that. Kind of like uh, what small claims court is versus criminal court, you know, in a way. Mm-hmm. So um, SEC civilly looked at our fund, uh, came back with uh, a closed investigation and no findings. And the DOJ, the Department of Justice, looks at criminal activities in our fund. Um, after the investigation said we have looked at the fund and there'll be no further investigation at this time. And so these are two agencies that have unpacked our fund for 18 months from uh, January 2019 through 2020. And those were the findings, no findings. No findings at all through two government agencies. In ter- I want to go backwards to the dividends. Sure. How much was paid per share to your investor? A dollar and 76 cents. Okay. Is this the first set of dividends that were paid to investors since the company um, raised money? Yes, for a novel dividend. Okay, and I get it. I invest, I have money in the market. Mm -hmm. It's an investment. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. It's the name of the game. But for anybody who is an investor or anybody who's watching this interview, when you hear a dollar and 76 cent on your return, it seems- On your return is per share. Per per share, I'm sorry, per share. It seems very low. So number one, are you paying these dividends quarterly now? Do you expect it to go up? I I want to interrupt you. It does not seem very low. That is a matter of perspective. Um, Our investors don't feel that way. Most seasoned investors don't feel that way. Most who compare their Other dividends from major Fortune 500 companies that have been around for dozens of years don't feel that way. When people look at their stock reports, that's not the common that commonality. People that look to pick apart or find something wrong with our fund, um, they feel that way. They feel that way about everything that we do, right? But in a pandemic, you you, Sean, you know we're in a pandemic right now, global pandemic. Absolutely. Major companies are shutting down and losing money right now. Yep. Do you know that a black owned company that's only two and a half years old that went through an 18 month investigation during a pandemic just paid a dividend as the largest active group economics ever in our, in our, our history? It's perspective, brother. Yep. But that's why we're doing this. That's why we're doing this interview. Right. right? I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm giving everybody a different perspective to consider. Correct. But through a global pandemic where major companies are shutting down, laying off, and giving up, we just paid a dividend as a two-year startup company, emerging markets company. We hadn't been around 12 years, we've been around 15 years. As the first black-owned company in its real estate reggae space, Grant Cardone, the great Grant Cardone, suspended his fund. He has a reggae fund. He suspended his fund. So it was too expensive. So my point is people are suspending funds. Yeah, but Greg Cardone also had a class action suit brought against him by his oh, investors, which uh, is his business, but he, he, I, I could understand why he would suspend his fund. My, 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 this is my whole point, though. My whole point is perspective. That people in the reggae space are having all kinds of trouble. People in business globally are having all kinds of trouble. So for someone to look at the Tulsa Real Estate Fund, because how you feel about Jay Morrison, to say, oh, they paid a dividend, but it wasn't that much, though. While people are shutting down, you knock our progress on something that no one's ever done before in history anyway, as a new company figured it out for us. Guess what? That dollar 76 per share is more than anyone's ever paid out in a black owned reggae real estate fund in history. So there's no one else is better to do it too. Is that factual? Factually true. Factually true. So there's no one else to compare us to to say, is it small or is it large? Small compared to who? Who's done better? If you are speaking, uh, if you're speaking from the standpoint of apples to apples, maybe you got a point there. If I mean, isn't speaking, apples to apples are kind of the best? If you're speaking a typical, putting your money in the market, 
in the market. Just that's just, not what it is, though. You, you're not you going bananas. Explain, not, elaborate, uh, elaborate, because yeah. maybe maybe yeah. I have. A, so put a, your a money in the market, right? Put your money in the market, right? Mm -hmm. Is a whole different kind of company that has a whole different access to liquidity. So you put your money in the market. The market has the ability for the whole world to invest into it. So that means you could get capital from the whole world all day, every day, which allows you to have the capital and equity available to grow and scale your company to all kinds of degrees. Mm -hmm. Because your capital is liquid and it's open to the market. So that's a whole different kind of uh, business model and opportunity than a private Leon regulation tier two real estate crowd fund as a whole different process, right? So in the market, for instance, great point, Sean. In the market, you could pick up your Robinhood app, your E-Trade app, yep. and you could go invest some money. To, oh, I like what Jay Morrison doing. You know what? Let me invest $25. Let me invest $50, right? The market can always get money. If you want to invest into our company, say we were open, you got to go through a whole subscription filing, an AML check, a KYC check. You got to go through so much that you might get tired of it before you're done. Like, man, I, I rock with Jay, but damn, I got to fill out all this. I got to be accredited or not accredited, right? So, so it's a whole different opportunity, a whole different space. You can't compare the markets in that way. And then even in the market, you got companies that are paying out $0.76, 76 cents dividends, $0.25 cents dividends of major conglomerate companies. So if you want to go bananas, you got to look at that and then look at we're a two-year startup. So the companies are comparing us to how long have they been around? How long around hundreds of years. And, and you, you know, good explanation. Let me ask you, and I should have asked you this earlier when I was speaking about your staffing. Is there anyone on your, because you have thousands of investors who are entrusting you with their money. Uh, tens of thousands. Tens of thousands, right? I'm the fiduciary, yep. To, to, to my knowledge, prior to this, you have never run a fund. You, you've been on the side of, of buying and selling real estate, um, obtaining loans. Is there anybody on the team that this is what they do? Like yes. they, they, go yeah. ahead. We're, we're, we're surrounded by all types of internal team. Well, I would say some strong internal team members that do what specifically they do in the function of the fund. Mm -hmm. When you come to treasury, to compliance, to admin, to portfolio management, to um, technology, and all of the mark, right? All of the facets of working a fund. So yes, I, I've surround, surrounded myself to the best of my ability, and continue to surround myself with those internal and external experts, meaning our vendors, our consultants, and the full team and cadre that I put around myself to be the best fiduciary I can be. Yeah, I, I, sure. I have to ask that because you, being a fiduciary of this fund, people want to know my money, my money is in good hands. Not, not, not that it's anything unethical going on, but once I entrusted into this fund, there are qualified and capable people who are going to oversee this money and make sure it's dispersed properly and we get the best properties we can get and loan it out properly. Our best attempt and our best effort to perform in a business. So, so, so let me ask you this. I know you don't have your license anymore, right. but is there anybody on staff or the people on staff that currently have their license? Because you mentioned several properties that you guys- yeah, help you. Right there, let me educate you in the community. Please. Having a real estate license is like one of the lowest on a totem pole of the real estate hierarchy. It doesn't add more credibility to the fund to have a real estate license. All to answer your question, yes, I do have people on staff that have a real estate license, but it doesn't add much value or credibility because they have a real estate license. That doesn't mean much to a fund to have a real estate license. Having real estate knowledge, a realtor is just a broker. They're a middleman. Mm -hmm. Right. Anybody can take a 75 hour class and be a realtor doesn't mean that they're bringing anything to the table or have that much knowledge. Not to discredit realtors. because I've been one. I'm just telling you, stop thinking as a community that having a license meant something as, as, as a realtor doing real estate. That's just a job. Um, but there are uh, and there is an individual on staff that has particular licenses in the financial sector and financial industry um, who uh, is a key player in our organization. 
there's other real estate professionals who are key players in organizations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But that real estate license doesn't mean much. But we do have uh, experienced and uh, credible and vetted folks, you know, working with us, of course. Okay, so you know, and I'll, I want you to clear something up for me. Uh, and you're right; you make a lot of great points. All I'm just telling you the truth. I'm not even explaining. I mean, I'm not like excuses or no. I'm just telling you the truth. That's what it is. Yeah, but it's still a two-year startup, it's and everybody startup. has to keep that in mind. That's not from the ground up. From the ground up, no blueprint, no blueprint. But I'm we doing it for us. So how can black owned people, how can black people, especially when are social conscious or progressive or liberated minded, revolutionaries, pan-Africanists, whatever, how can we own our own institutions if we never go try? So let, let me ask you this. You have a lot of people on the internet who, I mean, there are whole sites, whole sites. dedicated, ded literally dedicated to muddying your name, muddying your credibility. Uh, and I won't give them the credit on during this interview. Where does that come from in your opinion? And just truth be told, why do you do these interviews? Because it seems like there's so much, uh, so much going on and so many people trying to discredit what you're building now. Mm -hmm. why, why, why do you think that is? And, and, you know, even when you agreed to do this interview, I was a little surprised. And more importantly, when we spoke offline, I told you I'm going to be asking some difficult questions, but I'm the consumer. I want to know. Right. So why do you even do, and it's a two part question. Why do you think they come after you so difficult, so hard? And why do you make the time to do interviews like this? I don't do many because nobody doesn't even ask me. Everybody just assumes what everybody's saying is right. Nobody's even asking me to even like, and from a fair perspective, like on some real, like, bro, I just want to know. I ain't trying to catch you up. I just want to know. Mm -hmm. I mean, let me feel your spirit, bro. Like, you want some BS? Nobody's even doing that. It's just only the gotcha people that want to like actually talk about me because they get views by saying my name. And why? Um, I can't tell you why, King. Um, one of my friends and, and, and mentors said, you agitated some spirits. He came into the Black House where we mentor young men every other Saturday. He said, man, look at this. You got Malcolm on the wall, Harry on the wall. Bro, bro I'm living, not just me, we as Tulsa Real Estate Fund, but me just following my, my gifts, my calling, bro. I'm just, I'm just doing what I thought we were supposed to do as black men to build our community. I'm just trying. I ain't trying to get over. I'm just trying to build up our community. We said we want to build, so I created something we could build from. Why does that irritate people so much? It's kind of like, who does Negro think he is? Like, how do you raise so much? What qualifies him? How you gonna say what qualifies somebody to follow their assignment and they call and they anointment and they gift? I don't know what qualifies the oil in your life and the gift on your life. I'm just following mine. So do you think it's more of a crabs in a barrel attitude? Or for if, if I'm looking at the from the outside in, you know, everybody can't be wrong. Like from your perspective, is it just look, I'm doing my thing and I just don't know? Or, or is there validity? And well, validity I'll let you answer though. that, and then I got I another know, question. Well, let's get there, bro. Like Validity to what, though? Like, you ask me all these questions. Validity to what? Validity that the SEC and the DOJ investigated and said no findings? So when the investigation happened, it's like, aha, see, I knew it. You get investigated. I knew it. But then the investigators say no findings, and you still say, but it got to be something. Bro, come on. What is that, though? You tell me what is that? You know, there are a lot of gotcha uh, clips on the internet, but again, I, I we're getting it from the horse's mouth, right? Like, I'm, I'm saying, but you're, you're like, not bro, I'm, saying this. I'm not perfect. Sorry, y'all are, but I'm not. My bad. I'm not perfect. Have been perfect in my life. I'm very honest. I'm very self accountable. I'm very integrous. I love our people. I'll show that love through my works. I'm an open door. Anybody I've had a dispute with can come build with me. 3015 R. Martin Street, East Point, Atlanta, Georgia, 30344. You can set up an appointment, we come build. I'm about, I'm about building, King. I'm not about gotcha moments, social media, viral clips. I'm not about leveraging somebody name to clout chase. I'm not about none of that. I'm the same one that really be on the front lines for our people. I'm the same one risking his reputation and character assassination for our people. I'm the same one loving on our people, same one went to the street corners to give back. 
this is really me in real life. Like why that bothers y'all? I don't know. I'm not the one hiding behind the internet. But like, I'd really be here. I'd really be in the streets. I'd really be loving on our people. I've really created an opportunity for us to do group economics instead of talk group economics. I'm really trying my best. Has every decision I made from the inception of me being a founder of Total Real Estate Fund been the right decision? Hell no. Has everyone been made with the best attempt, the best effort, the best intention to build this company and be fruitful for our people? Yes, every single one. Will I guarantee this works out and be perfect? Nope, I can't do that. We opened a black house in January and February a pandemic hit. I can't control the world. Can I give my best to do something liberated? Something that hasn't been done since Marcus Garvey in 1919. Can I give my gifts, my talents, my life, sacrifice my wife's stress and trauma during her pregnancy? Will I do all that for our people? Yes, and I have. Death threats, extortion attempts, fake mock protests and goofy shit. Will I, will I offer all that for our people? Yes, I will, King. Because I said in 2014 that I would give my life for our people. So how can I say I'll give my physical life for our people when I don't give my reputation for our people? So a handful of y'all will tear me down, but guess what? I got over 14,000 partners that build me up and tens of thousands and millions of others that edify me every single day, that pray for me, pray for my family and love on me. But we focus on this goofy negative, negative energy and... I'll go back to the question is, what is it, though? What is it? You tell me. What's your thoughts? I mean, I mean, you're a journalist. You're the consumer. What is it? You said everybody can't be wrong. Wrong about what? What is it? What is the what? Outside looking. Because King, they, said, they said he's going to run with your money. Y'all ain't getting paid nothing. I mean, they're saying you're going to run with the money. They're saying that um, it's a Ponzi scheme. Uh, but the, So they could figure that out, but the SEC couldn't. They could figure that out, and the DOJ couldn't figure it out. The SEC couldn't figure it out, but this person online could from the outside in. So the SEC can download 50,000 documents from our company and has worked with public companies for decades and they can't see it's a Ponzi scheme, but Mr. Social Media Online, who doesn't have any of our documents, except what's publicly put a floor audit, they can figure it out. Have you personally invested in this company? In this yes, company? $10,000, yes. How much? To, and, and I'm talking about from a customer perspective. From a customer perspective, yes. Yes, I, I bought shares like everybody else, $10,000. I bought shares like everybody else. And again, these findings, are they public knowledge? Because they, it, it would, can we direct? They are. They are. Okay, let's, let's just direct the audience where right. they can go, because you're right. There are a lot of people online. They're hiding behind online. And they're putting this knowledge out there, or they're putting this information out there. If Sean, if, 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 uh, if, if Taisha or... James or anybody else wants to go and find these two government agencies, what they did in the investigation and what the ultimate findings were, where can we go find it? You go to TulsaRealEstateFund.com and I believe at the bottom we have uh, some links you can click to get right to it. Tulsa, T-U-L-S-A, Real Estate Fund, F-U-N-D.com. If you want to go directly without going through our site, you can go to SEC.com. And there's an Edgar form, and you can actually search on Edgar, E-D-G-A-R. You can put Tulsa Real Estate Fund, and you can find all of our audits, all of our documents, all of our financials, and what's called a 1U update of these findings. Got you. Uh, you know, it's been an interesting conversation, and, in, you know, I, I wanted to, because on, on one hand, what you're doing is extremely admirable. Thank you know, you. as as it's a my duty so say it again. It's my duty. Yeah, it's like, as a black you. man, it's on, but I think it's my duty. I, I feel as though as a as a fellow entrepreneur, as a black man looking at you, what you have built, what you've built, what you're building, it's ab admirable. But I also understand the other side. You know, if you are not 
success doesn't come without people taking shots at you. And the, the, the greatest success that you have, the more shots people are going to take. Mm-hmm. But again, you are handling a lot, to, it get tens of thousands of people's money. Right. That's where the, you know, so, so having the opportunity to- Why does that bother us so much? Because if, I, if, I, if it wasn't me, then who would it be? The banks do it, other funds do it. Everyone has an opportunity. I'm not stopping nobody else from doing it. You can start a fund, King, go ahead. Everybody can start a fund. I'm not stopping nobody from, you know what I'm saying? Like why, why, are, why are people so mad or interested in, in me? I'm not, I didn't monopolize the opportunity. I've talked to other influencers. Uh, I've talked to, I don't even want to drop no names. Like other big podcasters, top podcasters, all that. Who said, bro, I wouldn't have did that if I was you. I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't take that risk. Nobody wants to take the risk, but then we want to say that black lives matter, black dollars matter. We want to have everybody else take care of us. Mm -hmm. I believe in self-determination. So black people are going to be able to liberate themselves and have not only have equality, but have equity. We got to create our own institutions. So I can sit back as a black entrepreneur and be like, shit, somebody going to do it. Somebody better do it. Or I can actually be bold and brave and, and live off the, the, the backs of our ancestors and their sacrifices and go do the work. So is it That's- fair for me to say five, 10, 20 years down the road, I'm not going to see you coming out of the black house with a pair of handcuffs on and going through a whole Bernie Madoff trial and end up behind the wall for the rest of your days. That is a million percent fair for you to say. Unless there's Cointel Pro or there's people planning in an organization like they did with Marcus Garvey to set him up, to extradite him and imprison him. I can't say that I can't be infiltrated. I can't say that we can't be sideways attacked but I can say based on my own intentions, my integrity and my actual actions that no King, this is not a fake Ponzi scheme trying to get over. Like, how can we even you, and I, I know why you're asking it. I get it. I'm not knocking you, mm-hmm. but you really can't even like, like almost even ask that question. It's I a just big question to ask, but it's not really though. Why, 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 like, why don't you think? And the only, brother, I'm asking you this, the only reason I'm asking you, mm-hmm. Jay, is because you're handling tens of thousands of people. Right. But how much more vetting can you get other than a Department of Justice criminal investigation for 18 months, double backed with the SEC investigation to make you not have to ask that question? If I was on some BS, my brother... Like, you know what I'm saying? Like how much more, not to mention my own integrity in the body of work I've shown as a role model and hero for our people. Outside of that, and just moral feel goods. Bro, King, we've been vetted. I've been vetted, I'm continuing to be vetted. How much more can I, can I make my efforts and intentions and actions clear? Is Bro, you asked me about assets. I showed you all the assets that we funded. Black women that we funded, jobs that we've created. It was the thing, this is my whole point, there's no win here. You get investigated, you're wrong. You get cleared from investigation, you're wrong. You raise money, I think you're gonna run off pay nobody. Oh, you pay somebody, it's not enough. At what point is it, you understand? Like, like at what point, and I'm cool, I accept that there's gonna be a crowd of people that feel like that. I'm not even minding y'all. I'm giving you this time right now because my wife set this up and said I should do it. I'm not even mind, bro. You can't win when somebody's committed to saying that you're wrong or you're this. Because I was wrong if I didn't pay. I'm wrong if I do pay. If I had paid a $50 dividend, I told y'all it's a scheme. You paid too much. You got to be doing something you paid that much. There's no, but you know who it is a win for? It's a win for those who could feel love frequency who could feel authenticity, who could see one of our brightest minds that Tamika Mallory calls me, that Tip calls me, that, that others call me, 
literally trying and sacrificing and taking all the darts for all of us. So somebody else can come behind me and follow the blueprint, even do it better. And they say, aha, I did it better than Jay Morrison. But I laid the blueprint and took all the darts down. That's cool. I'll take that one too, if it elevates our people. That part. But Jay, uh, you know, I appreciate you you not hiding behind or trying to dodge any questions. Um, I appreciate you educating people on where the fund is today. Um, and, and, you know, really trying to answer the questions as honestly as you possibly could. I think that in the end, you know, time will always tell, but at this point, you're innocent into proven guilty. You know, just as many people out there who are out there uh, shining light on on what they would like others to believe are, are fraudulent behavior, there's just as many people who have invested in you and will continue to support what you're doing. So Three times as many. There you go. So I would just say, you know, this interview was number one. It, it's we call it power move makers for a reason. And what you have done coming from where you have come from, you fit that definition for sure. And, and until a court of law or, or something comes out to where we can say, you know, aha, now it's been proven, you are a power move maker. It's, it's, no, you know, I, I got to reject that. What part? The part that you're even saying until. Like, bro. I would say off. until if we were talking about Barack Obama, it's not, it's not, it's not insinuating anything. What I'm saying is just I like would, I, but I would challenge you to say if our brother has been through investigations and our brother, there's been nothing found on our brother, and our brother has shown he's paid dividend, and there's nothing actual concrete, then we have to give our brother the benefit of doubt. Then maybe until better choice. That's a better choice of wording, and I'll say it because that's actually what I meant. So if our brother has been through a vest and through two separate federal investigations, and nothing has come out, then we have to give our brother the benefit of the doubt, and that is why I wanted to have you on this program for that reason right there. So. You know, again, I thank you for not dodging any questions. You answered some of the most difficult questions that I feel I could have thrown at you. Um, you know, in 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 again, we'll continue to support and consider the podcast a an outlet. Um, you. if you ever want to come back and, and and get anything out from your standpoint, you know, we're here, and this is why we do what we do is to shine the spotlight on brothers and sisters who have done incredible things in business, who have taken themselves from the worst, most impoverished beginnings and achieved high level success. So I thank you. Oh, I appreciate you. Can I give you a closing words real quick? Absolutely. I want those who watch watching to imagine, right? Like you and yourself or people you may know that might fit a little description, but it's like, for me, it's exciting the time that I'm in and that we're in. But just imagine like, you know, a lot of us, I was born in 1980, I'm an 80s baby. So imagine growing up through, excuse me, growing up through that era, growing up through, you know, single mom, my mom was on an abortion table, decided to get up and have me, single teenage mom, um, growing up, seeing all I saw, physical abuse in the home, sexual abuse, all kind of crack, coke, everything, dope, needles, all that in real life, going through all that, going through poverty, thinking you're gonna be nothing to yourself, thinking that your stepdad, working on the back of a recycling truck, making 35,000 a year, having a county job was a come up for us. You got a county job, you shh. Imagine that mind frame and being a dope boy at 15 to 25 years old and somewhere breaking out of that mind frame and seeing yourself as better, seeing your potential and seeing that you have more to offer the world. And to break out of that and to have ups and downs, launch businesses, but to be in a seat today with no college education coming out of a literal trap like where I used to be on 138th and Broadway in Harlem and 
all over the country, not nine five South. Like my real life experience is what I'm saying is I was telling my younger brother, to me, it's like we all we it's like we won already. For me to be an ex-dope boy, for me to be an ex-inmate on Rikers Island, for me to be an ex-misogynist, for me to be a ex uh all the negative things I was, right? Selfish, arrogant, um, all those things I were over the years. And some of these stories you hear might be a bit of my growth as a man and as a human. I might have been way more selfish. I might have been way more arrogant. I may have been more aggressive. I may have been a lot of things over the years, but it's who, but to be who I am today, a husband, Ernestine Morrison, a father of three daughters. My oldest daughter was born while I was in prison, King, in upstate New York. She now goes to one of the top colleges in the country about to graduate in a few months. So I just have a, a daughter born last November, Kobe, to be able to be a faithful married husband, to be able to mentor youth every other Saturday, to be able to launch this fund as an opportunity for our community. Um, coming from where I come from and what I thought was cool, what I thought being a man was, and what I thought, you know, all that, I just guys want you to understand like who I am as a person and when I talk about being a revolutionary and a pan-Africanist, I really believe our people deserve equity and our own nationality and real liberation, not just trinkets and tokens. That's my core. I'm, I'm, again, I'm, I follow Marcus Garvey. I follow Malcolm X. I, I'm really about being a, we all celebrated Judas and the Black Messiah and Fred Hampton's a revolutionary, but both of us aren't willing to join the revolution or support the revolutionaries of your generation or join the revolution. Your support or question those who tear down a revolution who have nothing alternative to bring that they built. They'll tear me down and tell you everything they think is wrong about me, but offer you no viable alternative. So I leave us with a question. If you think about anyone that's done something significant, a big power move for our people, not just business power move, for our people, think about everyone you've ever known in history or 450 years here on this side of the water that has made power moves for our people to advance. Name one of them, man or woman, who has not been attacked, who has not been torn down, and was not been, who has not suffered character assassination. Um, I'm not saying I'm perfect. I'm not saying like, yo, I'm just a perfect guy. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that I'm not a fraudulent guy. I'm not a faker. I'm not no, no get over. I'm not a scammer. I'm not no hiding behind some fake liberation mask. I'm saying, no, I'm the same one that spent two years to put the fund up. I'm the same one that, that launched it and that followed through off the launch. I'm the same one that fought through the pandemic. I'm the same one that got us a dividend. I'm the same one who went through the anxiety of two S uh, SEC and DOJ investigation. Not because I was doing something wrong, but I think all of you all, the DOJ, SEC, knocked on your door so I want to investigate you. You could be doing, you know, you had nothing wrong. But you're still going to be concerned about the outcome. Because you know how the system play. We know the system. But my family endured that for us. And then to still get criticized on top of criticized, those people ain't gonna never gonna change from no passionate plea in me, from no exposed integrity and transparency, but for those who resonate with this frequency and vibration, I'm asking for y'all support, y'all love. And I just want you to ask yourself, if it were not me, take Jay Morrison out of it and put Sean here or anyone else. Is there another black man that could have raised millions from all our 15,000 of our people in 22 countries and sat in a seat and not be tore down? I think there's not one. I just happen to be the one. Okay, I'm gonna ask you a very direct question. And, and, and you just said a lot and it's powerful stuff. And I'm going to turn that into a segment so that, because I think it, that sums up our entire conversation and it allows your perspective to be put out there in your words. So I'm absolutely going to put that out unedited and allow you to speak for yourself. Jay, you know, you have obviously done some something that's incredible, right? You have done something that is historic, but you have a lot of people who are discrediting what you're trying to build and what you've already built. So my question to you is, how do you sleep at night? Because there, and I mean this literally, because there are sites, whole sites that people have devoted money and time out of their life to do nothing but 
discredit the work that you've done. Do you sleep at night? How does this affect you and your family? How does that work for you? Yeah, I sleep well. Um, it, it does have an effect on my family and did have a greater effect on my family and me as we went through criticism from the moment we launched. So people are committed that this ain't right. I believe it ain't right. And no matter what is vetted, investigated, tested, paid, whatever, it still ain't right. It ain't gonna never be right. And they're committed to that. Uh, but so many people have shown through multiple capital raises that it's right for them. And I would challenge people to say, hey, if there's people that say it's right for them, even though it's not right for you, why do you feel so committed to use Jay's name in videos and blogs and websites and everything else on Tulsa name to voice your opinion how it ain't right and you're not even a part of the company? It's not your business. So why would you be minding it? It's not your business at all. And it's already been tested and vetted. So it says really less about me and more about them that they'd be so committed and mostly black people to tearing down a black organization and a black man, they're, they, they make it harder for me to do my job. Those distractions, no, not many fund managers have to go through those distractions. So I believe they intentionally distract me so I don't sleep at night. I have distractions and frustrations and anxiety, even going through a pandemic and I went through a personal surgery last year and having a daughter and life and everything else. I think that they, that's part of their tactic so I don't perform so I fail because of their efforts. And they can say, aha, we told y'all so, right? It's like, it's, and that's just a, a little theory I have. But um, again, I can't speak for those who speak on other people's business that's not theirs. I'm busy minding my business, our business, our over 14,000 partners, historic company business. Um, but by God's grace and my spiritual alignment, knowing that this is the price of leadership. This is the price of being a revolutionary. This is the price of disrupting the system. This is the price of leading a people who have been economically enslaved. Harry didn't have everybody saying, you go, girl. Nat Turner didn't have everybody saying, all right, bro, we out. Fred Hampton didn't have everybody saying, I'm with the revolution. Northern Malcolm X or Martin Luther King or, or, or Marcus Garvey, O.W. Gurley, the founder of Black Wall Street, they had whole campaigns about him. They had campaigns about Marcus Garvey that said, Garvey must go. So I understand that at this point of my career and my purpose in leadership, um, this comes with the territory. This is the revolutionary handbook. This is the black leader handbook. This is the script. If you do something progressive, you do something revolutionary, you do something disruptive, you're gonna get this. And so I can't fall into the trap of losing the sleep of falling into all the noises and the whispers in my ear, of all the distractions, because I got over 14,000 families that counting on me and us and the decisions that we make. I have a staff that's counting on that. I have a legacy that's counting on that. And I can't guarantee a win or perfection because you can't guarantee success in any business. You legally can't in our uh, filing space. You legally can't guarantee an investment, but you can't even do it as an entrepreneur. Now, one entrepreneur could, not even uh, 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 Elon Musk couldn't guarantee, he can't guarantee success. The great Elon Musk, can't. he can't guarantee success of Tesla. Right, am I right or wrong, Sean? Absolutely, absolutely. And, and so with me being mature enough to know that, I gotta know that I've reached a new level, which is gonna bring new devils. Uh, again, you know, with, with, with great power comes great responsibility, I suppose, um, you know, this just comes with the territory. So, you know, I think it's a heavy load to carry for anybody, um, you know, and you seem to be carrying it well. You seem to be, uh, you seem to come to, to a place that you understand that this is your purpose and it's what you're here to do. So if that is what keeps you going, I get it and I respect it. Um, would you say that 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 is exactly why you're able to weather this storm? Is it you determined that this is my purpose? Um, I'll say yes, and I believe I'm built for it. I believe all my life circumstances, obstacles, challenges have built me for this kind of pressure. Like 
This is some pressure. Don't get it messed up. It's some pressure. It's just pressure running the company, period. It's pressure running the company with four, over 14,000 partners. Imagine having 14,000 partners. Pressure. It's pressure as being a husband. It's pressure as being a black man, King. But I also recall pressure when I was on parole in New York. I was on bail in Maryland, on bail in New Jersey, and still selling drugs, trying to pay my lawyer to fight my case. Pressure. I remember going to the parole board, hoping that they let me go early. Pressure. I remember the cops pulling me over on I-95 in Delaware and had a quarter kilo in the trunk. Pressure. I'm in my early business days, getting started in real estate in 2005, not knowing how to send an email coming off the streets. Pressure. I remember when he said, uh, you can't do real estate with felonies. And I had three of them. Still got my license. Still turned up. Pressure. So I believe that God has built me for this, that, that those bankruptcy and being broke phase, being a millionaire, blowing it all, losing it all, and trying to figure out how to get it all back. Crazy pressure. 30 years old, broke. Broke as hell broke. No car, can't even go see your daughter in Virginia. Pressure. But so my faith has been built up. I believe I'm called to do this. I believe I'm a miracle man. I'm a walking miracle. I'm an extension of the bigger God. And so all that empowers me. I do have my days and my moments. I'm also human. And I have my moments. And I see my wife cry and suffer because of people trying to pressure us. Putting stuff out there, talking about her husband, talking about her, talking about our baby before our baby was even born. But like you said, with power moves, there's going to be obstacles. There's going to be power opposition. You got to determine if you're built for it or not. And um, we see too many examples to know, like, I, I, you know, you got to decide really when you all in for your people. And I think the biggest part I said was like, I've always said that, and many of us say it, we say what we would do in a situation. Oh man, if the police were beating down Eric Garner in front of me, I would have, right? But who's really willing to make a sacrifice? And so I do believe it's my purpose and calling. And, you know, in these interviews, um, I know you ask a lot of direct questions, et cetera, but for me, it's not, again, excuses, it's not even my explanation, it's just my truth. I'm just walking in my truth and just walking in my purpose. Like this Jay Morrison all day, every day. Like this me, so. Looking directly at me, mm -hmm. is Jay Morrison a scammer? Absolutely no, 100% no. I'm a real one from day one. Jay, I appreciate it, man. And I would definitely be, um, you know, using some of these as segments. And I, I, again, I appreciate the candor. I appreciate yeah. the directness. My man, I appreciate you too, bro. Um, yeah, great interview. Love. Where can people find you, Jay? Uh, you guys can find me uh, on all platforms, even my website, mrjmorrison.com. Instagram, Mr. J. Morrison. YouTube, Mr. J. Morrison. Always giving free grain. Twitter, Mr. J. Morrison. Um, I thank you for the interview. Um, you guys can also text me and join my text community, 404-737-5751. I'm always building that way as well and galvanizing and mobilizing. That's 404-737-5751. Shoot me a text. Jay, I appreciate your time. And again, the door is always open, man. Continue your success. And, uh, you know, you, you listening to you, you are built to endure this. So... God willing, everything works out. And I would love to um, interview you in the future where, where you're on the other side of right. scrutiny. And um, we'll just take it from there. But I appreciate you. Continue to be a power move maker. Uh, thank you, King. And I appreciate the, uh, you know, I, I was good, good journalism. Asking the tough questions, I ain't mad at it. And uh, also being fair in the answers, right? Um, in regards to your responses to the questions, not, not coming from a, a biased perspective. I appreciate that. My brother. All right, peace. What's up, guys? Thanks for sticking with me to the end of the video. Truly appreciate you. If you like anything you heard here today, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. And if you know anybody that can benefit from this message, feel free to share. Peace and love.